From the US company RAL comes the requisite CA1A and its energizer little converter box, the TI1B. Special thank you goes out to Danny from RAL for sending these units in for assessment and review. Let's begin. This $2,000 mid-tier flagship ribbon driver headphone is a first for CMA in regards to ribbon drivers. We've done electrostatics reviews here of uh, Aperio, HE1, Provera, etc. And obviously dynamic headphones and planar headphones subsequently. But this is the very first ribbon driver headphone. They're extremely hard to drive. They require their own amplification or converter boxes due to their impedance being ultra, ultra low, anywhere between, I think, one or two ohms. So it's something absolutely ridiculous. Um, so that's why we get the second part of this, the TI-1B. So first and foremost, let's uh, get the TI out. You get this really nice magnetic class box, very simple and straightforward. I believe this unit will set you back $500 because it doesn't come with the headphones. You buy it separately or buy as a bundle. So this is the TI-1B. It looks like a transformer switch mode power supply, to be honest with you. Then we get the headphone cables because this obviously came as a bundle together. These are the headphones themselves. First and foremost, let's look at the cables and then get them out of the way. This one is to connect the CA1A, for example, to the AHP2, the KNHA300 Mark II, or the LTAZ10E over there. Anything with taps at the back for speakers. Then we have this one. This is an XLR to 6.3 jack for the TI1B. So you connect the XLR to the inputs. This one is 16 ohm, this one is 32 ohm. Then we have the standard cable. This is the cable that you will get unless you go for the silver one for the headphones themselves. It's a XLR, hold on. Ah, let's start with this one first. Okay, keep, it's, it's a very nice straight cable actually. It doesn't keep its shape, it's, yeah, very nice cable. It's a bit rubbery, it's nicely braided, very loosely. And obviously the headphones uh, cable itself is a female XLR instead of male like we have with our usual dynamic headphones or planars, etc. for one specific reason. And that is so that you don't accidentally connect it to an amplifier that obviously can't support this because it'll freaking blow up the headphones. Uh, impedance is so low. This is the XLR male to male for balanced inputs. So for example, the 16 ohm one into a Bliss, Siegfried, or anything else. And it's a very short cable, so that this uh, TI-1B needs to sit in front of the amplifier, so be aware of that. Obviously, the impedance being so low for these headphones, cables make a tremendous amount of difference uh, the way it does on IEMs. And this one is a nice silver one. This is what I've been using consistently ever since the headphones landed. I like these ones a lot. They're light. They don't really keep their shape that much. Female XLR. And we're going to talk about what type of connection it is when we look at the headphones themselves. Obviously, this was the TI-1B. This is the headphones themselves. We're going to come back to those in a second. It's a very military-esque sort of design. It's not designed to be uh, like a Meze Audio, for example, or, a, or a, a ZMF. This is a very functional design, very lightweight, very comfortable. I love how airy these headphones are. Honestly, these headphones are so open. It's very, very good for office environments so you can hear your surroundings, etc. The adjustability of the headband is very strange. It's like a seat belt. Uh, so you've got these tiny little holes inside it. You peel it off like that, two hooks, and then you just put it over, make sure it cinches inside these little nubs and that's it 
I found that the size fit me perfectly. It just depends on your shape of your head. There are three or four holes, um, and I think you can punch this leather to actually get some more if you really wanted to, if you or if you've got a tiny head. Comfort, absolutely no issue. Head strap, amazing. Then we come to these pads. Let me peel one of them off. And they just come off like that. There's a couple of little hooks. So as you can see on the driver, there's a couple of little hooks up top and bottom. And it's very, very easy to pad roll. Thank you, Raul. Thank you, Danny, for that design. I can't stand the whole nappy changing sort of scenario for uh, pad rolling. It's a bit of a nightmare. Um, honestly, I can't take it anymore. Either magnetic or something simple. This one is this foam material. <laughs> it really is like a loofah or something from a shower. It's extremely sonic driven rather than aesthetic driven, but they are comfortable. They don't feel like they scratch your face and they're very, very simplistic in regards to placing them back on the headphones. Up top and on the bottom, it just literally hooks like that. And obviously there's two sets of these, um, one open, one closed, one called coffee bean and the other one is just standard, I think. Um, because of the different characteristics of sound they provide. So you just go, you bend it a little bit. It's like a tiny thin, plastic thing and it just sits there and then you just go yoink like that there you go simple straightforward these are the open ones comfortable headphones open back here with these little tiny holes i have absolutely no problems with the design of the headphones these are the second pads wedged same as the other ones but completely sealed that's the headphones you can't use this headphone by itself, connecting the cables with your own amplifiers unless they're ribbon driven or they can support ribbon headphones. That's why you need this. This can connect to any amplifier that's got sufficient power. Honestly, I recommend anywhere from a Bliss power management upwards. Otherwise, uh, these are very difficult to drive. You're going to be maxing out a lot of amplifiers, including probably Bliss as well, depending on the genre of music you're listening to. But for me, I found Bliss was sufficient. Going from the Bliss to the head trip over there on the CMA couch, uh, which I just finished reviewing, that's why it's not back on the desk, has been quite an experience, genuinely. These are some of the most scalable headphones in these weird category it sits in I have come across. They're very comfortable. And if you've got long hair, you're going to be uh, fixing your hair every two minutes because they seem to drag on your hair as well so that everything's just a bit odd. This floppy design, I'm not a fan of. I wish they used a thicker, more stable leather the way ZMF does. Um, I think that, I mean, it's easily doable. These, these can be very easily replaced if you just get a nice bit of leather. But these aspects where it connects to the nubs really does need to be thin. Make sure if you do decide to replace it. But this is very comfortable, very nicely designed. That's the headphones. Ribbon drivers requires its own little energizer box. Can't be used with all amplifiers without it. A little bit quirky, like an electrostatic. So with that, let's talk about the sound. We have used the RAL requisite CA1A with the Hollow Audio Bliss over there, with the Wells Audio Head Trip on the CMA couch, as I mentioned, with the KNHA300 Mark II tube amplifier, with the Siegfried from Spirit Torino, and every other amplifier that has come through CMA while this unit has been here, and it's been here for quite a while, including the Benchmark AHB2. Oh, DACs have been the Rockner Wave Dream, the Hollow Audio May, uh, and anything else that has just trundled through CMA, like the Dave, the TT2, etc. Make sure your amplifier has sufficient power because the scalability of these headphones is nothing short of insanity. Going from something like a Bliss, which is a flagship amplifier at 3.3K, to something like a head trip at 15K, and it's a 50 watt into 8 ohm amplification, it was shocking. So how do these sound? Well, the CA1A is the equivalent of the HD800S on steroids. It's basically that sort of soundscape and sound characteristics. It takes a lot of cues from electrostatic speed. It's 
the most ridiculously fast headphone I have heard this side of electrostatics. It's absolutely insane. But its tonality is neutral. It's clean, it's clear. Using the open pads, it's ultra detailed, but with some leaning in the treble region where it comes forward a little bit and it doesn't quite sound natural on solid state, but only for specific genres and specific instruments. Otherwise, this headphone is open, airy, and the way it layers is holographic galore. What I find interesting is that the sound doesn't seem to come from the drivers, but it seems to come out of the air. Like when you're wearing the headphones, the drivers are here against your eardrums. As the sounds surround your head, it feels as though they're popping in the air here and that there is no driver making that sound. The speed is insane. And the air between the instruments seems to be a void where it feels as though you can pluck one instrument, for example, a guitar, drums, vocals, and your mind's eye can go with your index finger and thumb and grab the sound and place it here with nothingness around it. It's quite a surreal experience. Its tonality, its visceral impact, can really change with the amount of power you give this unit and amount of technicality and control. Like a huge difference. Bliss was fantastic. Texturally rich, nicely toned, especially for real instruments, viscerally impactful. But when I put it on the head trip, it became a completely separate headphone. So I'm going to talk to you about how the RAL CA1A, these requisites sound on that, because on that it's driven to its ultimate performance level. So you can get an idea of how these headphones perform when they're pushed to its limits. And then we can talk about some of the other amplifiers afterwards. Using an electronic track from Infected Mushroom, for example, is extraordinarily punchy. When people mention electrostatics, they, unless it's a, a Pirio or a Bravera or even a Carbon, it's thin sounding and bass is not their kind of region. And honestly, that for some reason in my head, this is what I was thinking about ribbon tweeters and ribbon drivers uh, as well. I was completely floored and very, very shocked actually to find that this wasn't the case. I mean, electrostatics and ribbon are very different, to be fair, but the speed and performance and resolvability of these headphones in this category of two to 3,000 was quite remarkable. Honestly, I think it might be the best for that category, period, in this category whatsoever. I don't think anything else can touch it, genuinely. And I think your amplification is going to vary. It's a very neutral sound characteristic, but the treble region does seem to be having its own characteristics so that it does feel a bit icy, a bit crunchy, a little bit less organic than the mid-range and bass region, which I find absolutely freaking spectacular, especially when it's driven properly with high amplification. Layering is superb. Textural information is pretty good. It's not too bad. Detail retrieval is off the charts. It's absolutely insane in this category. Speed, like I stated, insanity. But tonal balance is where I have a little problem with this. It can sound a little cold, a little analytical in that treble region and a little splashy, mostly with metal instruments. Otherwise, textural information for drum skins, for cellos and stuff all seem to be pretty fantastic. And it seems to be a pretty decent headphone for real instruments, but for electronic music and for pop music and for certain mastering, it seems to highlight a lot of areas in the treble region that comes across a little unnaturally. I personally feel that these, these are the coffee bean pads, adds a little warmth. Uh, on a lot of amplifiers, it sounds a little bloated and it does bleed into the mid-range a little bit. But what I have found is that these take longer to seal. And when it's sealed properly and you're using something like the head trip, I feel as though the bass response of this is absolutely insanity. The slight warmth that it adds, I think adds a little better tonality to the headphones. You do lose a little bit of detail, 
you do lose a little bit of technicality but genuinely for me personally i would take that just for the smoothening out of that treble region and uh, bringing a little organic nature into it incidentally these uh these uh, open pads if you insert a tiny bit of foam of the same material here so that it's not completely sealed but halfway it really truly helps with the treble region like genuinely it really does become exceptional there's also a filter you can buy for room that really does by all accounts add a lot of tonal density and meat onto the bone i honestly could not get that um filter to work personally i tried my absolute best but when it does work i will update this and put it in the comment section how much of a difference it made but for me on head trip and rock the wave dream i don't think it needs it i think it was absolutely spectacular its speed is just mind-boggling in this category and this side of electrostatics going down from the head trip to hm1 hm1 could not power this properly i think uh, some people who wanted like loud volumes and oomph, it, it just didn't work uh, bliss does a lot better um, but even then you are approaching like 80 percent of the pot most of the time for classical music and things it, it's a very hard headphone to drive i would say uh, power amps is your best bet ahp2 uh, the, obviously the head, the head trip over there and something like a purify in the cheaper category possibly uh, you do need a lot of a lot of oomph. the more power you provide for these headphones the better the performance becomes genuinely it just thrives with power control and technicality these are one of my favorite headphones in this category it's, it's kind of insane how addictive they can become um, because it seems to improve on HD800S in a lot of areas. It adds a lot more oomph, a lot more punch, yet it's that sort of holographic openness where it feels as though the drivers are so quick it's not actually making sounds, but everything's just coming out of the air. Um, on tubes, it adds life, it adds warmth, and it on the open pads, I think is my favorite way to run this. If you can get a tube pre into a power amp, you're getting the best of all scenarios. So for example, using the Z10E, the LTA Z10E as a tube pre into the head trip, and then the head trip into this, where you've got a touch of tubiness, you've got oomph amounts of power from the head trip, technicality and control, and then obviously, as you can see, the drivers are singing and at their best performance they possibly can be. Um, DAX do make a difference. I mean, it's so resolving, to be honest with you. You can pick up on amplification changes and DAC changes quite a lot. Using Hans Zimmer's Pirate of the Caribbean live, let's break down the frequency response. I don't feel as though separation of instruments with this 50 track orchestra was problematic. Everything seemed to be nicely resolved. Bass region was quite textural, very visceral, very impactful for cellos and for the wind instruments that go low, etc. Um, body was definitely there. As we climb up to the mid bass, hit and weight and macro detail was definitely fine. I wasn't having any problems with this category either. Mid range was open, vocals came through very nicely, very texturally well done for this category of headphones. Honestly, it was quite impressive. Lean sounding, linear sounding nicely separated nicely detailed and then we go to the treble region especially when Hans Zimmer's part of the Caribbean live hits its crescendo part one and part two it does tend to become very convoluted in the upper mid-range and treble region and it became a bit painful on solid state um, I think the resolvability was there the separation was there but the tonal balance wasn't and it was off and it created this discord and dissonance of between the instruments where you felt as though everything was colliding together and not obviously being articulated very well. As a quick summary, the RAL CA1A genuinely is the most detailed, resolving and quick headphone in this category of two to three thousand dollars. This headphone is absolutely spectacular. There are a couple of caveats which we have mentioned. Um, one being the head strap is a little uh, DIY um, in regards to adjustability. <clears throat> That's gonna be a bit annoying. Second of all, obviously, you have to deal with the 
the TI-1B. But that's not a problem really. Um, that's not really a caveat because it works with every amplifier that's got enough amplification. But I think the biggest one for me is the, on the open pads, the treble region, it's a little bit metallic. It's a little bit splashy and the organic nature of the symbols is not quite right. Um, and this does show for me personally. On tubes, it's a little bit better. Um, and I think with those filters, I've been hearing it's, uh, it improves that a lot. And uh, in my scenario, putting a little foam between the open pads, not sealing it completely, really did help like a tremendous amount. Um, maybe another pad can be made that has that tiny bit of opening rather than such a big opening up and down. But I like the rounded pads on the head trip, genuinely. Um, I'm willing to sacrifice a little detail for everything else. I think it's lovely. Should you buy the CA1A? I think it's absolutely spectacular uh, at this price point, genuinely. This is really an impressive, comfortable, good sounding headphone if you've got the amplification for it. Especially with a touch of tubes, it's absolutely great. Scores, build quality, three tigers out of five. It's very comfortable, it's very well designed. It's very, very kind of ergonomic. It's just a little bit DIY feeling, that's all. Um, but very comfortable. Sonically, I'd give it four solid tigers. I think uh, if you're driving these properly, it's spectacular. Um, genuinely, it's a, it's a fantastic, interesting sounding headphone. It doesn't sound like anything else. It's got its own innate characteristics, the way electrostatic does um, and I think its speed is just phenomenal. And overall scoring, I would give this four out of five Tigers. I think it's fantastic. Uh, Danny, thank you so much for sending this unit out for review. I really do appreciate it. And I can't wait to see you guys over again at CanJam London. And you lot, our viewers. Hopefully I'll get to meet more of you guys. Um, it'll be fantastic. Until the next one. Peace.